Well, it is a beautiful day in Wisconsin. Coming at you, Crushing Iron Podcast. Today, folks, it's July 14th, the year 2022. Like Mike said, welcome aboard, everybody. You're listening to the Crushing Iron Podcast. This is our last episode in the 500s. You're listening to episode 599. Yep. It's July 14th, and they're still uh, shooting yeah, fireworks. That's a, lot of, <laughs> that's, a, that's a lot of hours we've spent talking to each other and uh, over the past five or six years, but it's been a blast. It's been a blast so far this week, but yeah, it's a, it's a pretty nice day here in uh, Overland Park, Kansas, or as they call it here, OPKS, uh, and hope you're having an outstanding week. Again, it's a Thursday, uh, but your first time tuning in, welcome. We appreciate you giving us your time. We know you have a plethora of options in the triathlon podcast universe, and just podcasts in general, your time is very valuable, so we appreciate you uh, tuning in today. Uh, we cover it all. We do swim, bike, and run specific podcasts. We do race recaps. We also do a lot of race previews. But for the most part, Mike and I as coaches, athletes, best friends, we just sit back, relax, have an open arts discussion about what we're going through in life uh, as, as human beings on this planet, but also athletes and coaches. Uh, we also frequently talk about what our own athletes are going through. You know, We work with a wide range of athletes all across the globe from beginner level athletes uh looking to their very first sprint or even 5k all the way up through elite level amateurs uh trying to get back to kona and everyone in between uh, and we'll frequently uh kind of uh pivot towards what they're going through uh and training in life via the communication we have with them and training peaks emails text messages in the like, and then I'll uh, drive the discussion of the day. Like it might just might just do that today. Uh, we'll also hop into our Facebook uh, Facebook group. That's Crushing Iron Group. Uh, answer one simple question. We'll let you right in. Uh, a lot of great people in there. Wonderful community. Uh, a lot of resources in there with some experienced athletes who have, I mean, for the most part, been through it all, seen it all. So use them. Uh, don't just lurk. Ask questions. Uh, we're here to learn. We're here to educate ourselves. And uh, as we as we often find, we are as you and I actually you know talked about. Uh, off air before we started, you know, we're always evolving things. We're always trying to figure things out and, and, uh, observe things and figure things out and things that happen. And then how do we, how do we get better? And then we also know that we're just never satisfied in general as a, as a type A species, we're always trying to improve. Um, and it, well, it is a very challenging sport. Um, there's just so much information out there. You got three different sports. You have to race as one. You got transitions, you got nutrition, you got gear, you got all these kind of things. So yeah, use it. it it's honestly, as it's a great, uh, great resource to have, uh, at your disposal, uh, disposal will be a, uh, uh, be a part of that community and be active in it. Uh, so we'll sometimes I'll go in there and, and do a little Q&A and then I'll drive the topic of the cast. But that's it. Uh, we don't do sponsors. We don't do ads, but we do have an agenda. And it's a very important one. It's to uh, do our best to keep you happy and healthy in your endurance sports journey. Mm. I do have one thing I want to bring up right out of the gate is, uh, you know, we talk a lot about, I've talked to a lot of athletes lately and um, about race, there's some of the races or whatever and how, at the beginning of the race, their breathing gets out of whack in the swim. And mm -hmm. uh, we've talked about it in, ad nauseum about how it, we believe in really warming up before you get in the water and getting the breathing going and getting your arms, you know, blood in your arms and that sort of thing. But so I w always want to reiterate that. But I also, especially, it's really nice here today, but, you know, it uh, there's rarely a time when I... And this is where I make the mistake, I think, is when I even start running, when I feel like I'm breathing really good, you know, it takes me a while. Mm -hmm. So I want to, I just, even though it's hot out and, uh, you know, it makes it, you know, a lot of times the dew point and humidity make it even harder to breathe. Um, I, I just, I've really been getting into this idea of warming up before my run. And, you know, that's just kind of the um, dynamic movements and things of that nature. And it's really been helping me. And I also think when you start your run, you have to understand that you're not going to be breathing at your peak, you know? So that's right. what, you know, when we start, we talk about that in the run too, is like get off the bike and run, you know, maybe a mo or a minute or two minutes slower than the pace that you want to run because you want to, you don't want to exacerbate the breathing problem by going too hard, even harder in a race because you're amped up and all that kind of stuff. So I just wanted to throw that out there as far as like running in this weather when it's so hot, but you know, it's counter, it seems counterintuitive to warm up, you know what I mean? But I think it's a, yeah. I think it can be 
an effective way to have better runs, especially if you kind of let yourself run slow in the beginning too, because you, you know how it goes, man, by, you know, I know that run you had was a little different because you're pr probably going after it today, but, um, you know how it is. It's like you get a mile or two in, you're like, oh, man, now I'm really cruising. And I think that's mostly your kind of breath situation, settling down and stuff like that. It, it always takes, and, and yeah, I totally agree with you, especially right now with, you know, the temperature and stuff like that. It always takes, you know, most people 10 to 15 minutes to get into a rhythm and get up a good lather to figure out what's really going on, right? You know, what, what kind of bells and, and alarms or, or no alarms, right, are going off? Um, and you do, you see this a lot of times too with athletes. I see it with myself and, uh, you know, in terms of, and that's why you can't always judge necessarily a workout within the first 10, right? Like, so like for me specifically, sometimes, you know, and this is caffeine related, sometimes like like this morning, for example, I hopped on the bike. I did a 15 minute warm up. My heart rate was was a lot higher than it was yesterday when I worked out in the afternoon. Like you know, we we cast it yesterday, and and then I got off like maybe one o'clock. I think I did it easy, like hour and 15 minute ride. Heart rate felt super efficient. It was a total uh, aerobic ride, and um and my heart rate was you know, very under control, very low. But I hadn't had caffeine in you know three four hours, um and then. <laughs> The and then today this morning I had a you know a, a full cup of coffee and then kind of a half cup of the next one no breakfast went straight downstairs and my heart and my heart it was like 100 it was about 100 it was about 10 beats higher than normal than it was yesterday and just just getting going and then after about 30 45 minutes after doing intervals my heart rate actually lowered a little bit um, and it wasn't because you know, I was going through this like significant, you know, heart rate effort change. It was more so that I had, I had allowed some of the caffeine to kind of dissipate from my system, which got my heart rate a little bit lower. Same thing goes for, you see this a lot of times, like when athletes, especially when they race, right? Like everybody talks about brick runs and, and doing brick workouts and are so important. If you don't do them, then, you know, you're never going to be able to run well off the bike, which also isn't true. But people also talk a lot about is how like how in insanely high their heart rate is when they get on the bike. Like if you look at most athletes, like when you go back and look through data, uh, through uh, races from sprints, Olympics, 70.3s, fulls, most athletes, unless there's like a super hilly, you know, uh, super hilly course, or they're really kind of just burning it out at a very high uh, percentage of their threshold, most athletes' highest heart rate is, again, as long as they don't kind of dawdle and tea party their way through transition is the first 10 minutes are on the bike, right? Because they, they, their heart rate is so high in the swim. It, that's it for me. Every single, my highest heart rate is always the first 10 minutes of the bike, or it goes, it goes the first 10, 10 to 15, it gets pretty high and then it goes down pretty low. And then at the end, sometimes it'll uh, raise up again. If I, if I push it towards the end, but that's, it's in the beginning, same thing on the run. A lot of people, you come off the bike, you are, you know, you're going, th you leave in two different environments, right? You're coming up the bike where you get a, you're spinning out pretty good. Usually you've got the, you know, a 20 mile an hour wind in your face. You got a nice breeze. You're sweating. You just don't know how bad you're sweating. You hop off the bike, you, you get all your gear on. Then all of a sudden it's like face is drenched, body sweating, no breeze, especially this time here. And then you're just burning a pot. Your heart rate goes sky high, right? And your legs feel like rocks. And you're like, man, or you're, and you're going too fast usually. And your heart rates, you know, goes right out of the gate. But then you got to get, then you got to battle it and kind of get back things under control. So th there's a whole lot of work that goes into figuring out, you know, and, and judging yourself and your effort on not just a, you know, marrying yourself to what your heart rate is telling you, but also being able to conserve your own energy and pace yourself appropriately and let it come down some and allow yourself to play the long game. Right. And that's why, you know, I don't race my heart rate, but I always have it as kind of a backup field to kind of tell me what a different, I kind of paint a different picture from what I'm seeing, especially on the bike with power. And then the run, I just kind of have it on in the background. And then frequently I just, any two races alone, I think I've taken my heart monitor off and tossed it. So I was like, yes, I don't, I don't like what you're telling me. Um, I'm just mm -hmm. going to go by feel. Uh, but it is, it's, it's one of those things that can tell you part of the picture, but not necessarily the whole picture, because again, heart rate is so dependent on, you know, how much did you sleep, right? What time of day are you working out? You know, if you're going to work out like, you know, we mentioned this, uh, before we went on air yesterday, I ran in the morning and the dew point was super high, humidity was super high, and then I ran at like one, same length, 
and my my midday run where the tip was 90 felt like so much easier <laughs> from a from an effort standpoint um, but I also didn't have a, didn't have any more caffeine in my system. You know, I wasn't super stressed. Like, so there's a lot of things to take into account when you look at that. But the biggest thing is is to give yourself 10, 15, sometimes 20 minutes to really get a good, solid picture of who you are. That's why having kind of a good progressive warm up is nice and easy. Like, so a lot of people like to skip out on on their warmups. You know, they might have 10 or 15, 20 minute warm up. They'll scale it back to five because they're in a rush. But I, I said, you know, sometimes that's fine because you the, the goal of the work is just to get right into it. Um, but most of the time, especially when you're under a lot of fatigue, it takes you a while to get those to get your legs rolling around and kind of figure out what you really have. Work things out, get your legs to open up a little bit. And then usually you figure out that you're somebody totally different than you were 20 minutes before, the, you know, 20 minutes into the workout. Yeah. Well, we call it training and we call it practice, I guess, for races. And we and, mm-hmm. you know, um, you know, everybody talks about, you know should I do more drills or things like that? And that's all debatable. That's, I mean, I think that those things can, depending on what they are, especially like little run drills and, you know, you can do drills at, cause I think a lot of times that people don't grow up doing something that they may have mechanical flaws. And, and like recently, one of my things has been um, just trying to get my glutes to activate more uh, before my mm-hmm. runs, you know, stuff like that. And, and I think it, you know, in the short term, it seems to be helping. But anyway, as far as training and, and practicing for the race, which is ultimately what most people in the sport are doing, right? And, but so when we talk about <clears throat> running off the bike and brick work and stuff, I used to be this guy that was like, you know, get off the bike and just hammer 20 minutes or 30 minutes, you know, just go fast because that's, I wanted to get faster, you know, and I wanted to prove that I could do it, but that really isn't practicing racing. And I've come around to this right. thing of every, every time I put in a 20 or 30 minute off the bike run, it's always like, use this as practice for the start of your run and mm-hmm. learn how to get off the bike, end it, you know, like, you know, I'm sure you are warm down or cool down, but like get off the bike and practice starting slow. And starting and working on your breath and getting that under control and stuff like that. So when you do do it in a race, you've had practice doing it. Because I think, you know, people, I I just think that that's usually what the problem is on the run for a lot of people. Especially if they think they're trained up and then they just sort of blow up or whatever. It's probably they started too hot. We talk about all the time. Mm -hmm. How many people have ruined their marathon in Ironman by running those first three or four miles too hot? Or same with the 70.3, the first couple of miles, you know, it's like you got to give, I, I've always loved what you said about doing systems check, because I think that mm. it's almost like uh, I do that every morning. When I wake up, I'm like, all right, kind of look around at the ceiling. I'm like, all right, what do I feel like today? You know, before I get out of here and just start tearing it up, some days you can just tell that you got it. But yeah, just like whatever you're doing in the water, when you get on the bike, kind of just see how you feel, let it happen. You know, those first 10, 15 minutes of every, every event aren't, you know, make or breakers for most people. You know, I, I guarantee, you know, I get it that some people are kind of redlining throughout a whole 70.3, but they have certainly practiced that too. You know what I mean? If right. we see, like we were at chat 70.3, some of those pros coming off the bike are just, they're on it, but I guarantee you they work on that a lot. You know, their, their, their engine and their, chassis and everything is built to a point to withstand that. And most of us aren't. So we get in, like, I think you were talking about last time is you get into a race. It's like, yeah, I'm just going to go. And I haven't done any of this before. And I expect everything to be different. Well, I, I just, you know, it's sort of back to training to who you are and where you are and just in mastering that and then getting better at it. You know, I think it's something that you can get better at is getting off that bike and kind of coming out strong, but you got to be, you know, you got to be able to run more than 13.1 miles hard, you know, if you're going to try something like that. I mean, I, the, the difference in training levels for pros and, and most mid-level age groupers is, is like tremendously different. Oh, I mean, it's like, and everybody likes to like, you know, and, and I get it. They're exciting. Like you watch the YouTube channels or whatever. I mean, I don't, but a lot of people watch the YouTube channels of the professional athletes and then they'll try to like, you know, take what they do and apply it to themselves. I'm like, you do realize that they do a 70.3 in three hours and 40 minutes. Yeah. Three hours and 40 minutes. They're done before you get off the bike. They're done. They are totally finished. This is their job. This is like, this is what they do. Um, 
And, you know, this is their, this is their profession, right? They also train most of them 25, 35 hours a week, right? That's insane. And it is like, you know, I, I think one of the, I think one of the biggest things, um, to really kind of understand and realize is, you know, you, you talked about systems check, right? And, and we talk about, we, we always, we, we refer to, you know, long course racing. And th- this also applies honestly to 70.3 racing, uh, and sprints and Olympics and really everything, half marathons, full marathons, 50 Ks, hundred miles, everything. We always talk about, you know, at least for like, you know, 70.3s and fools is what I'm doing now going to allow me to do X, Y, or Z in the future. Right. And, and I think, and, and that's, it's, it's kind of like, listen, game day racing, long course racing. Is it really a game of chess? Right. It's, you, you can't just do one move to be the end, right? You have to think two, three, four moves, you know, um, in the future. Cause that's how you have to, in order to plan accordingly. And again, that's one of those things that, you know, as we, as we're here, listen, we're, we're in July, we're more than halfway through the year. A lot of the people who listen to our podcast do have 70.3s or fulls coming up. We got Lake Placid coming up. We got March and Blonde, Ironman Canada, Wisconsin. You know, we got, it, it's loaded, right? The rest of the year is is the full on, you know, at Chattanooga. All these, all these big time races happen between now and, and really Thanksgiving. It's the meat of the year. It's the heaviest part of the year. It's also the heaviest part of the stress year, right? In terms of training outside, you know, it's, it's brutal for most people right now. And you have to, like, there's a, one of my favorite quotes is, you know, uh, you know, you should execute basically it's the, it's not, I guess not a quote, but what I took from the article was basically you need to execute your perfect race within or under your level of fitness before you try to, race over your level of fitness. Mm. And what that means is, is that is most athletes try to race over the level of fitness. They, they, they don't, and being that they don't go back and look at their training, you know, objectively, they just want a time. Now, whether they've done the work or not, they just want a time. They don't swim enough, but yet they expect to swim and come out of the water fresh and they expect to still bike, whatever. And then and they expect to run whatever when they haven't run enough and they over race and they over race compared to their level of fitness, what you would, what you should always do is at least before you can get to the point where you can try to like push the needle and and race past that level of fitness to really just extract every ounce of performance you have in you is try to just try to race the perfect race within your level of fitness. And doesn't mean maybe getting the best time, but a lot of times it'll allow you to do that because you've executed it perfectly, but set a plan, right? It's a great time of year. If you've got 70.3 races that are kind of your prep for, for an Ironman is is you don't have to necessarily race, race it, right? To just blow yourself to smithereens, but be specific, right? Like a chess is very calculated, right? And, you know, they, that's why they don't put it out front, you know, at a Cracker Barrel to sit in your rocking chairs. You know, they put checkers, right? <laughs> chess is, is strategic and you have to be strategic in long course racing. And from the time you get in the water, but in terms of, of chess and getting to know yourself, that's how you also have to kind of govern your own body, right? And what you see, because your effort up that hill, Right, or you effort down that hill, or your ability to draw back and, and do 10 to 15 seconds slower per minute mile, or your or your you know decision to spin up a a, a a super steep incline versus get out of the saddle and sprint it, you know, or your your decision to pass a a group of 10 cyclists down the road because they're just annoying you because they're drafting. Doing that surge, is it worth it, right? Like in an athlete who commented on the race from a Muslim in 70.3, they were having a great bike there. They were going to up the pace when they found themselves basically riding pretty equal with another athlete and decided to slot in, you know, uh, four or five bi- bike links back and get a free draft in the legal zone and save a little bit of time. Again, decisions that are made. Everything you do is a decision that needs to be thought through because it's going to impact your ability to sit, to have a different decision. If you find yourself you know, getting like, for me example, like I, I went out in a rain this morning, mile one, I felt like trash. Cause we always feel like trash. I think in mile one, cause your body's waking up and then mile two, I felt okay. Mile three, I feel like a champion mile four. I was trying not to die. Uh, and my, my decision had to be, Hey, do you, do you, uh, try to keep up this pace you're running or do you just 
make the decision to get the time and the distance in and just not do something stupid. And my decision was just get the time and the distance in, don't, something, don't do something stupid and really, really, really slow yourself down to make sure you're, you're kind of being safe because it was a little warm and I was, I think, probably kicking it over a little bit too hot. But there is you have to know these warning signs, right? And you have to anticipate and, and play towards those those strengths, right? Because we all have our own strengths Swim in, in swimming and cycling and running. A lot of people's decision-making, a lot of people's their fueling, a lot of people's just general fitness. But the point is, is that the, the, the greater your fitness, right? The more opportunities you have to also make poor decisions because you, you mm-hmm. are moving and, and swimming and riding and running at such a greater speed or a greater effort and intensity that when things go bad, they happen pretty quickly. Yeah. Right? Like yeah. they just have kind of happen in an instant because, you know, it, going back to something we've referenced on multiple podcasts. And I think a few weeks ago when we did our heat, our, our heat uh, cast was that, you know, uh, they talk about heat exhaustion and, and, uh, and, you know, the heat illnesses you get where they happen in five K's and 10 K's because you go so hard, so fast, so quick that you don't really have a slow alarm, right? Like you do in a half marathon or full. Once you get the alarm, it, the game's over. Right, it's done. You're already overheated. You're already suffering from um, some pretty significant uh, heat problems, and that's what also happens. The 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 more intense you are, that's what I see. See professional athletes; they're either moving at light and warp speed, or walking. Right, right. They're yeah. jogging. They they just kind of like one or the other, and that goes for athletes too. The the harder and faster you go, the quicker you have to be, and the more in tune with your body you have to be because you have to see the warning sign before it comes. Right. Like we always talk about in terms of getting really, really hot. The goal should be to stay cool. The goal should not be to get cool because once you're trying to cool yourself and get cool, it's too late. Mm -hmm. Right. And like once your heart rate reaches a certain, you know, uh, a certain peak, it's no longer about keeping it there, getting it down. It's about you're going to have to walk. Right. You can't run and get your heart rate down. You know, you're going to have to walk. And then next time you take a, you know, one step forward to to run again, it's going to shoot right up. The goal is to keep it lower for the whole time. And that's just a, it is, it's one of the more underrated pieces and of thinking, right. Of being a, um, a good strategist when it comes to playing out your day, working through your weaknesses, playing towards your strengths, um, and not allowing those mistakes to happen. Or when they do happen, only allowing them to happen for like a second, right. Being really in tune with what's going on with your nutrition, with your feeling, with your pacing and making the right decision. And that's something that has to be kind of played out through your mind, but also, can be practiced from anything from a 20 minute run to a two hour run. And that's just when you, that's why I'm such a fan of, of really, really being present in, you know, in your workouts is because in order in order to be present in your workouts, you know, you have to be, you can't be, you know, I'm not anti music, but you got, you got to, you got to listen to your breathing. You got to pay attention to your body. Am I overheating? Am I going too fast? How do my feet sound? Am I landing hard? Is my, is my cadence good? You know, am I really focusing? Have I drank this mile? Like you, you really have to do be aware, especially this time of year where you can walk out the door and run for 30 minutes and bonk, right? You don't get any freebies right now when the heat and the humidity dew point is so high. So you do, you have to be, you have to be really on it. You don't get free passes this time of year like you do in the winter and the fall and sometime in the spring. Training volume is higher. Stress is higher. You're trying to get more fitness, which also means you have to be really on your P's and Q's. Everything you said there took me back to my early days of when I golfed. <clears throat> now let me explain. Um, <laughs> excuse me. Um, no, when I was a decent little golfer when I was younger and, um, I could hit the ball quite a ways, but there was the thing out there. It reminds me of old people golfing, what you're saying. And that, and I always feel like they were playing chess and I was playing checkers. And the analogy was great when you said a pro, you know, or the fast people, they got to be really in tune to it because when they start going down it's either they're just walking or whatever they're not you know they're not jogging they can't they usually don't um, go to that place so when you're golfing like I would play sometimes every once in a while I get out there with some really old guy and and he would just take out his three wood and just plop it down the middle about 180 yards and I would like bring out my big driver and try and just smash that thing and I'd hit it about 250 yards but it would be two fairways over you know and uh, he would just go right down the middle and and score uh, maybe like a par and I would have to scramble to get a bogey. And I was, and it was just never really sunk into me how you're just making smart decisions on a golf course. And I think the same mm-hmm. thing translates on a, on a triathlon course. And I just don't think a lot of people pick that up. You know what I mean? Like 
how many people have gone into TriCalc and actually plugged in realistic race numbers? You think it's probably a low number, you know, not many people do that. Well, I can do this. If everything goes right, perfect, I can do this and I can do that in a vacuum, you know, and I'm the same way. Um, you know, it's just like you think this thing. So it's just interesting to me how, like you said, when somebody's deciding to climb up a hill, do they go hard and really do the the seconds that you make up? And now we're, I'm talking about the bulk of people, not the, the tip, high tip of the the racing, you know, seconds definitely matter, you know, even in transition, uh, you know, on the podium with the pros and things like that. But for most mm-hmm. people, it's amazing. Like if you just decide to sit back and follow somebody up a hill and save a lot for later, you may lose like, <clears throat> I mean, literally like 10 seconds or whatever. I was thinking about that in the pool the other day. I'm trying to get faster and faster and I'm working hard and shit. And I look at my, you know, uh, a 50 or something like that. I'm like, damn, thought that was going to be at least one second faster or whatever. And I'm like getting upset about that, but <clears throat> how much time you actually save over the course of a day has, you know, it's like running out, out running out of T2. You, you want to come out, you know, and run well. But if you run those first few miles and then like, if you end up walking three miles at the end, you're I'm like, how much more time you're going to lose rather than if you're going to go run it, uh, 13 minute mile out of T2 versus 12 minute mile. And then the, the last four miles you have are 18, 19, 20, you know, it's just like, it makes so much sense just to play it smart. And I think when we talk about making decisions that are going to affect you at mile 18 or 20 of the marathon, I mean, it's, it's like, we say that, but I, I, I don't even hear it a lot of times, you know what I mean? And I think that if we just heard that more often, and made those smart decisions throughout the race and just got to mile 18 and was able to run it, even if it isn't your best pace, you're saving 20, 30, 40 minutes off of running or running versus walking or whatever. So I just, I think it's, it's just, it's one of those things that really is super obvious, but our egos don't let us do it, you know, because we, we have an idea and I'm not saying don't go for it, but I'm just saying, play it smart at the right time. And you'll know, you know, I've had races where, and you've had, everybody's had races where, you know, you got to the halfway point of the run. You're like, Hmm, okay. I still got something here, but you don't usually get there by being stupid Mm -hmm. or racing outside of what you really are. Yeah. And, and listen, like this is, most people have raced so far this year, right? You know, we're, we're second, you know, second week of July, most people have raced, they've done a sprint, an Olympic, a half marathon, a marathon, um, 70, whatever it is, like most people have raced, you know, and they've got more races the rest of the year. What, one of the biggest things as a coach that you look for when you kind of go through training and, and data and then race execution is it, people always want to say, talk about the data first. And the first, but the first thing you have to ask is, how do you feel like you executed? How did you feel? You can have the, you can have a, an enormous amount of fitness. You can be in the best shape of your life. You can have the best conditions possible. If your execution is shit, then you're going to race like shit. That's just a fact. Like it, and I think, I think most people kind of, because that's what happens, right? Like training again we talked about you know fall spring winter you can get a pass you can, you can totally get a pass and f up sprints and olympics sometimes you can kind of make you know maybe even a fueling mistake and you, you can get a pass right because the race is going to be done in about 30 minutes anyway you know so and you usually have enough glycogen stores and fluid and and, and calories in you to kind of just make it through in a 70.3 or a full <laughs> you don't get those passes and one of the biggest things that you have to really hammer into athletes, and if you're a self coach, your coach, work on a training plan, and again, you're midway through the season, it's time to ask yourself, like, how much do I pay attention to executing a session to the best of my ability, and not just haphazardly checking the box my way th- on the way through, right? It's because here's here's a great example. So, you people who always work by GPS. Can it, even if it's the simplest thing, like going around town, right? You know, they don't, if their GPS is working, they don't want to get to where they're going, right? You can use your GPS and you can also observe landmarks and streets and stuff, and then eventually figure out how to get to where you want to go. 
most people just turn on their workout GPS and the trainer or whatever and mindlessly go through things only focused on a number and are unable to execute on race day because they they don't know how to think through or have a thought process that's execution based, right? They're just because checking boxes isn't execution based, right? Checking boxes is doing it no matter what and making sure it gets done. That doesn't necessarily mean mean you're going to race great. And that's a huge piece that people under it. Cause I listen, we all, if you're a coach, you all, everyone has athletes that are, that are trainers, not gamers. And it's got nothing to do with fitness. Mm -hmm. Zero. Mm -hmm. I work with a few, you work with some, we, everyone works. If you're listening to this podcast, you might be, you might identify as a trainer, not a gamer. And what that means is that in training in a singular session, you can fucking nail it. You are the man. You are the Strava champ. You are the KOM. You are the peak performance king. You can nail every workout and every session on point, on interval. But when it comes to race day, can you put it all together? Right? You can you can, you can follow and you can trace right in training. That's all it is, right? Training is tracing. Tracing something on paper, getting it done. Racing is a work of art. If you pick up your brush on race day, you don't know how to trace it. You don't know what's going to happen. You have to actually do it yourself. No coach, no specifics, no one intervals, a course, 3,000 people, the temperature, the wind, how you feel. And then it's also what? A little bit longer than what you normally do. Right. Yeah. Right. And it's all done in succession. Right. You got to nail your fueling. You got to have you, you know, nail your pre. You got to nail your taper. You got your swim, your bike, your run. So many things are thrown at you. And you're like, damn it, all I got is a paintbrush. What are we going to do? And some people are great at, at, you know, just super quick thinking. They know how to think quickly. They know how to triage. They know how to cover up mistakes and, and create successes later on in the day. It's just a very, very challenging thing for people to do. And that is the difference in being a trainer versus a gamer. And if you want to be a gamer and right, ga gamer means taking your fitness and training and translating it to, to peak performance on, on race day, you have to be thoughtful. You have to think, you have to think to yourself, I can't, I'm going to outsmart every single person on race day. And you also going to outsmart my ego. I'm going to outsmart my ego. I'm going to use every bit of my fitness and I'm going to execute this race to the best of my ability. That doesn't always happen. That doesn't happen in an hour long trainer session, right? Or a 45 minute tempo run or, or your 2000 yard noodle swim that most people do, right? You don't gain that much from that. You're just checking a box, but the longer the race, the more complicated the race, the higher intensity and the faster speeds, the, the more difficult terrain, the wind, the fueling you got, you're on your own baby. And that is just, that, that is a, a strength that you have to hone in and think through um, on links of a chain, right? And that's we we've, we've we I think it was one of our better podcasts we did back in the day was talking about how everything is connected, right? Mm -hmm. The chain from yesterday connects a chain today and affects a chain tomorrow. And a lot of athletes can cre can work with the single chain, right? But then you then you uh you know let's say they put in two or three months of training, everything they do is a link of a chain. They throw it in a bucket. After three months, they dump it out, and trainers. They're all single chain links. <laughs> Nothing's put together. Makes a huge mess on the floor come race day. But the gamers, they dump out their bucket 50 feet long. No chain. Everything's connected. Everything has a reason. Everything has a purpose. Now they're ready for race day. And again, like, and you could, and that's the thing. Like, you could know that about yourself and fix it. You Some, some people, you can't fix ability. Yes, you can get faster. Yes, you can do better. Yes, you can perform and be more consistent. You you know, there's a lot of things we can always do to maximize, you know, certain, but there's, but only up to a point, right? We're all given a certain set of skills, you know, but yes, are we, most all of us going to pretty much never hit that peak. Sure. But, but, you know, we all have that certain set of abilities, but there are also things like you can learn, right. And, and, and work through and teach, you can become better at executing. And no one wants to focus on that. They just want to focus on what's, you know, what's my average heart rate today. what's my, like, listen, d stop talking to me about the, the, the finer points of training until you can paint the whole picture on race day. That's what's important, right? Because that's what you're going to gauge how well you're doing <laughs> on is race day. That is the, that, that is what tells you you're getting better or not. And then the question you have to ask yourself is, 
did you even execute it correctly? Like everyone thinks that you can train, you can train consistently and have knockout days, uh, you know, during your build. And then on race day, you're just guaranteed to, you know, have this best, best, you know, best session. Then going back to like the professional athletes that people watch on YouTube, three and a half hours, they do a 70.3 in seven and a half hours and change for a full most of you for a full are out there six hours longer. Some people double the time, right? That you're out there longer. That mm. think about how much time that is. How many more decisions you have to make and how different we are. You have to execute your plan. Plus at the at the at the point of the race, they're racing to race other people to win, right? They're not just racing themselves. And to race yourself and get the most out of yourself, you have to be thoughtful. You have to be uh, a strategist. You have to be calculated to get the best out of you. You can't just expect to perform well because you perform well in training. In order to put it together, you got to be um, you got to be smart and you got to practice and you got to know your body. Mm. Yeah, as you were talking there, I, I wrote down a question. It was um, how much are you learning in your training? And mm. I just. I mean, I, I don't want to, you know, I'm not like some great race or anything like that, but I, I feel like I do get the most out of my training. I mean, I, I probably could put in a lot more volume. That's my Achilles heel for sure. But I got to tell you, man, when, whenever, and I know you're the same way, it's like when I'm out training and I, it could be the simplest thing, like a, a, a short little pincher hill or something that I, I run, now I run on my loop. But every time I hit that thing, I run it differently. And the reason I do that is because, you know, sometimes I want to work something or I want to, I, I want to see how it feels or like, do I want to go up this thing slow or how can I go up it moderately? And then sometimes I'll just kind of get a good head of steam and I'll blast it. But I'm always thinking about if I see one of those in a race course or same with my riding, whatever. I, I just love the idea of, you know, we talked about this thing when people look at Ironman race course maps on the bike and that first, you know, 25, 30 miles looks like a just flat as a pancake. And I, and I think a lot of people just were like, well, I'll just kind of cruise out and spin down there, but there's probably little rollers or pinch. You just can't really tell off that map. And I'm always just looking for experience, um, in my daily training and how that may appeal to something I face on the course. And I just love to sort of master these little things. It could be a little, like even just a little bit of a roller up and down or something like that. And I'm like, how do I, what's the most efficient way to handle this or to run through this situation? Or can I push myself out of my comfort zone a little bit here and just try it and see where I go? And it's like, I don't, like I'm getting older, so I, my memory's going, but those connections <laughs> usually stick with me. Like I've seen this before, my body recognizes it and I understand how this feels and how I did it in training. So I'll do that all the time, you know, like with uh, longer runs or whatever. And I'll, I'll think to myself, all right, well, this is mile and whatever, 18 or 20. How am I going to handle this right now? And I'm always planting that race comparison into my head just to kind of go through it before I go through it. And I just, I, I, that to me is about understanding and, and racing smart and, a lot of times I don't think I race smart, but I probably race smarter than I think I do, if that makes sense. Because um, mm -hmm. I also think that racing is hard and a big part of successful times, I guess if you want to call it that, or successful races is you got to have a different level of dig down, you know, and at what point do you do that? And, and like, I think that's what you say a lot of times, this smart, you've got you know, so many times you can go deep in the well during a race and you just don't want to do it at the wrong times. You know what I mean? And I think that's a, a big, huge part of how you say this is chess, not checkers. It's like you, you could do it right now, but save it for later, man. <laughs> you know, because mm -hmm. that's the whole thing, right? Is like, are you going to have enough to finish? And I know over the last year or something, I've, I, I've been kind of dabbling with the run walk thing and, and I'm starting to go back again, you know, back to this thought of, you know, when you're out training and you feel like walking or you want to get your heart rate down, well, work on getting it down jogging, you know, work on controlling it in game and not, 
you know, sort of stepping out of the game for a minute. And I think those are all things with uh, mental connection and it all plays into being smart. That's what, what you mean. I think a lot of times is like, just don't burn this right now because you're going to need it later and it's not worth it right now. You know, one of the, one of the things I look at as, as a coach, when you give a a great indicator of decision-making and thoughtfulness is how you see athletes choose to progress through intervals and training, uh, swimming, cycling, running, you've got the, you've got three types of athletes. Um, you've got the ones who, let's say you give, you know, 10, two minute intervals. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, so you got 10, two minute intervals, you've got three, three types of people. You got the, the, the ones who just blow out the beginning, they go super high for one, two, first, second, third, fourth interval. And then they're, they're done. Right. Then they, they didn't think, right. They did not just think they didn't feel right. What do I really have today? I know what the numbers say, but what do I really have today? And do I know what I have yet? Nope. They just, they just tough it out, right? They're going to crush these first four intervals. And then the next six suck, right? You got those, right? And those are the athletes that usually on race day, just mindlessly assume that the race is given, right? And that they're going to swim, they're going to swim, you know, they're going to swim hard, even though I've only been swimming once a week, I'm going to bike my ass off and we'll just see what happens in the run, right? Mm -hmm. Hope isn't a strategy, right? It's a plan to fail. Then you have the second athlete who, uh, you know, has the 10 intervals and then they basically execute them evenly across the board, right? Let's say the mid range is, you know, 200, they're in ERG mode, right? They hit every single 10 minute interval or, or you know, two minute interval, all 10 of them are exactly the same. They feel like they've crushed it. I've nailed it. Everything is exact. Is race day exact? Nope. Did you really do the intent of the workout? Nope. Right. You just calculated your way through things. Racing isn't calculated, right? You have to be able to respond, right? And then you have the, um, and those type of athletes on race day are great in controlled, perfect environments where they can execute everything perfectly without any interference. Well, guess what? Racing ain't like that. Then you have the third type of athlete. You got 10 intervals, first three to four, a little bit lower, still pretty hard, but lower, moving their way up gradually. Fifth and sixth, up a little bit more. Seventh, eighth, and ninth, yeah, they're up a little bit more. Tenth, nail it, but not nail it too much to overdo it to fuck up the next workout. Mm -hmm. That's the kind of athlete that traditionally races the best. Why? Why much? Same goes for running intervals, right? Negative splits. You know, (laughs) you see good athletes that'll start off at 10 minutes and at 630s. Give me that. Give me that person versus the one that starts at eight minutes and only get works down to seven forties. Hello, not really, not really a huge negative split, and you took out too fast, right? You you had a you had a pace in mind, and you went with it. You didn't go with your body. You went with your 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 ego, right? And what usually happens when you see the athletes kind of gradually work their way up and up and up, you know, through the workout, they're listening to their body, they're figuring out what they you know what they have for the day. And they're doing just enough that's required to get better, right? They're thinking strategically, not just about the warm up and the intervals and the cool down, how that affects the next and then the next and then the next and then the next, because that's chess, right? And that's racing. So when you do, when you do, you know, sessions, whether it's intervals and swimming, you know, or cycling or running, whatever it is, think that way, right? What I'm doing now, not just from a physical standpoint, from a mental and emotional standpoint, how I can think through and and plot my course to success. Am I making good choices or am I just kind of going through the motions, right? Thoughtlessly, right? I'm just jamming out to my tunes. I've got, you know, I've got just, I've got JT in the background. I'm I'm boom bopping. I'm, I'm, I'm ripping and raring it. And then you get there with the workout. (laughs) You're not even really sure what you did. Right. And a lot of athletes do that. They're, they're mindless in their, in their rides. They're scrolling through Facebook and Instagram, they're chatting, they're texting. Like, are you in the moment? And then on a race day, got no headphones, you got no Snapchat, you got no TikTok. And then where's your focus? Right. It's like people don't know what to do and they don't know what the body's doing because they never paid attention to it. What's, what's that alarm going off in the background? I've, I've never heard that before because I've been too distracted. Oh, that's me overheating and underfueled. Oh shit. Mm. Too late. Right. Yeah. You just got, and again, like that's, 
everyone obsesses about you know the data and the numbers, but it's how you use them and how you plot your course to be successful, right? It's that that's what makes a successful athlete, and it, you can so frequently outrace and beat athletes who have trained you know, trained more and put in more hours and quote unquote worked harder. But listen, just like they say, you know, work smarter, not harder, race smarter, not harder. Because most of the time, especially the longer the day goes, it's about how many good decisions can you make versus bad decisions Mm -hmm. or just not make decisions, right? In general, they just kind of go through the motion until things go wrong. And then you don't really know what to do. So you panic and then you're done. You know, so it is. It's one of those things that, again, halfway through the season, and then we can we can uh, end it up here. But you're you're just so half of the season. You got plenty of time to knock this out. You got plenty of time to pay attention to these things. You got plenty of time to prepare and stay focused and and try these things out, right? And become a better racer. Don't be a trainer. Be a gamer. Mm-hmm. Wow. Yeah. It that thing about I've, I've had my coffee. Today. <laughs> That's good, dude. The thing about, and I'm the same way with, I, I love running with music. And I think I mentioned that I washed my iPod the other, or a couple of weeks ago or whatever. And, but good, solid decision making during the day, any day, or in a race for sure, is all about being closer to the moment you're in, you know, because of the, dis- like you're saying, I mean, we create distractions to get away from it. And, I just, as I've been running without music, I, and I, I look, I love it. It, it does make it easier to me and whatever, but I, I've been, I've noticed that I've been, man, I wish I had that thing right now, but then I kind of turn it back in and then I sort of focus on breath again. And I think those kind of things are what racing is all about is about not getting out of your head and, and doing silly things. And there's something really powerful about, you know, I think when I started this sport, you know, there was a saying that was like, you always swim in your box, you know, and Mm -hmm. you you just, you don't get out of it. You just stay right in there, you know, and you swim. And that means like within yourself and you swim your own race and the whole nine yards. And I think it's just, it's very difficult to train yourself to do that for 12 hours. You know, that's, it really is almost a meditation throughout race day. And if, can you just stay with your breath and not get too caught up in like these external, you know, distractions in your mind and things like that? Because I think it just, it, it seems weird and it seems boring. It's like a long day of not really, you know, but the minute you, when you're in the moment like that, time goes by a lot faster too. So that, that's mm-hmm. a, that's a real good thing to practice. I think during training. Agreed. Totally. Agree. Couldn't agree more. Couldn't agree more. Thanks a lot, dude. Appreciate that. Yeah, you got it, man. <laughs> That's it, man. That's a wrap for uh, this week. We got a big birthday party for Hayden on uh, Saturday. I'm sure that'll be full of presents and cake and a couple meltdowns from six-year-olds. So looking forward to that. Got family coming in. Um, and it should be about 100 degrees. So we're all going to wilt and weather our way to a happy, fun-filled day with cake. That's the kind of day that you love, I know. <laughs> listen, listen, I'm going to be, uh, it's, it, I told you as we got here and, you know, I've been, uh, I probably started overtraining in the extrovert, you know, department and socializing. So I've been really reining it back in, uh, in preparation. I got to go pick up my mom and, uh, in-laws, uh, at the airport tomorrow. And then, uh, I got some other people coming in town. Then I think I say we have like 30 people coming over Saturday, which is a lot of people, um, the host little the water host. thing going on. In the, yeah, it's it's a lot, dude. It's just a lot. Um, it's just a lot. I think I might go for a ride or something to kind of get out of the house. <laughs> but no, it's all good. It's all fun. And uh, he's already asking. You know, it's the, that's the thing. It's like when you have a birthday party early, you still got his birthday. Is like is it until next Thursday or next Wednesday? It's the twentieth. Is his oh. birthday. Um, but it's worked out to have his birthday party this weekend. So then it's like, when do I get my presents? Can I open them in? It's like be dragging out for a week. Yeah, and then he's like, already like, hey, like this morning, he was like, hey, can we talk about Christmas? I'm like, I was going to say, like, no, <laughs> like, no, we're not talking about, we're not talking about Christmas because he wants to make these last additions to his birthday list. 
and he's oh. a big like brooder guy. <laughs> brooder is like a company that makes like these really, you know, pretty cool like you know vehicles and and stuff like that. And he's all into landscaping. Like I'm not kidding, dude. We'll be in the middle of a conversation, middle conversation, and a mower will crank up seven houses down. <laughs> And he's got like Superman ears, like his, his eyes will, will click over and his head will like twitch. And then he'll be like, I'll be right back. He'll run outside front steps and look down the street and be like, yep, I got three sit mowers, stand mower, two weed eaters and trailer. And I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, I'm like Dude, who cares? And who really cares? But that's all he's, you know, that he's always been like into landscaping and we're in ball. So that's all I cares about. But anyway, that's what he wants. But he was trying to add like a late edition landscape truck and trailer to his birthday list. I was like, dude, that ship has sailed. We're not doing any late additions. You can't sign up on race day. We're not doing any late additions. He's like, what, what about Christmas? Can we start a Christmas list? I'm like, Mike, I can't with you right now. You just need to go do something, play with all the too many toys that you already have. And we'll talk about Christmas in November because we can't even talk about Christmas till Thanksgiving anyway. So we'll have that conversation later. Mm -hmm. I love it. Yeah, I love it. And uh, we love you guys for listening and uh, being part of our community. As always, go to our website, c26triathlon.com. It's our one-stop shop for all things coaching, camps, and community. Uh, if you're looking for some coaching help for the remainder of the year, click on that coaching tab and peruse our roster of coaches and pick the one that's best for you. Uh, and as usual, if you need anything from Mike, he's available, crushingiron at gmail.com. If you need anything from me specifically, c26coach at gmail.com. All right, my man. All right, dude. I'll talk to you later. All right.